Well, welcome to the Davos Agenda Impact Session on Accelerating Clean Energy Transitions. My name is David Victor, and I have the pleasure of moderating this session. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for your flexibility as the schedule has been adjusted uh, uh, due to other changes in the, in the Davos Agenda uh, today. Um, I think everybody knows that we face an enormous set of challenges around transition of the energy system to make it much more sustainable. Those challenges hinge on redirecting investment. Uh, this is not cheap. It's going to involve trillions of dollars. And a lot of success is going to hinge on the emerging markets and developing countries, which are really the focus of our, of our discussion today. Depending on how you measure it, uh, they're going to be uh, central to half or more of the total expected global effort uh, for for cleaning and accelerating the energy transition. We have a terrific panel uh, for the first ha half hour. We're going to have a discussion with our panel, uh, and then after that, we'll break into an another half hour for forum members. We have a terrific panel to begin the discussion today. Uh, we have Diego Mesa, who is Minister of Mines and Energy from Colombia. We have Simpson, uh, who is the EU Commissioner for Energy. We have Fatih Barol, who is the Executive Director of the International Energy Agency in Paris. And we have Joe Taylor, who is President and CEO of the Ontario Teachers uh, Pension Plan in Canada. And so we're going to begin with a few minutes uh, response to some initial uh, questions and then uh, widen the discussion out uh, from there. And I want to begin with you, uh, Diego Mesa. Your country has enormously aggressive renewable energy, clean energy goals. You've also been enormously successful in, in meeting those goals. And I'm curious as to what your experience has been uh, around which policy frameworks really matter the most and how have you been successful in attracting private capital to that mission? Good morning, uh, David. Thank you for the introduction. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here again with you. And I thank uh, Javis and the World Economic Forum for this invitation. Uh, to go right into to the question, David, um, in the case of Colombia, I think uh, when when we when I think about you know what investors are looking for, uh, first obviously we need the natural potential, and Colombia has that. Uh, you know, solar radiation in Colombia is about sixty percent higher than in the rest of the world. Uh, wind blows in some parts of Colombia uh, twice the speed uh, of the world average. And um, we also have stable legal systems, stable democracy, stable economy. So a lot of the ingredients were there. When we came in into, into this administration in 2018, what we were lacking was a framework for uh, variable renewables, for energy efficiency. And we work exactly on those policies. I think I've said this um, in, other, um, um, in other forums, uh, but we do believe that we need to have fiscal incentives that are tied to investment. So rather than having, for example, tax holidays, uh, what we did in 2018 was to build a framework that would have, for example, 50% uplift on investment on variable renewable energy efficiency. So if you were to invest $100 on either those technologies, uh, you could deduct from uh, your corporate income tax uh, you know, $150. Uh, we have also uh, focus on eliminating red tape uh, making the environmental licensing process much more uh, expedited. And we complemented this with other measures that we were thinking uh, to attract investment into capital intensive industries. So, for example, we reduced the corporate income tax rate uh, from 33 to 30%. Uh, we also made VAT um, paid on capital goods uh, creditable towards corporate income tax. So, it became a, an advanced payment. So, and that was complemented with other two policy bold moves that I think are worth mentioning for a country like Colombia that didn't have uh, a significant portion of uh, its power matrix made up of renewables. The first one, uh, auctions. So we were very clever in our auction design uh, to make sure that we created a platform that was competitive both for power generation, but also for uh, the, the buyers of power, the distributor companies that worked quite well in 2019. I must say after, you know, a first fail experiment that uh, shed some light in how the product and the auction mechanism had to be built. Uh, and the second one that was inevitable, uh, and you know, we were criticized internally, but turned out to, to work quite well, uh, was the renewable purchase obligation. Uh, so we did introduce that, and, and part of the reason for that is Colombia is rich uh, in water, in hydro resources. So uh, the main criticism at the time was that with uh, you know, mostly wind and solar, we we're going to increase the price of electricity, the price of energy. 
And exactly the opposite happened. And the reason was because we have we, we are endowed with both solar and wind power. So I think, you know, those three, the combination of three policies, uh, having fiscal incentives that are tied to investment, having, uh, you know, a sophisticated auction design that is competitive for the two sides of the market, and uh, having the renewable purchase obligation actually uh, pave the way for being successful. And obviously, we're thinking about the future. Uh, so we'll continue with auctions this year. We have a new auction for renewables. We, will, we just launched the first auction in Latin America for storage of electricity at large scale, using large scale batteries. Uh, that's going to be a complement. Uh, we'll, we'll close the auction mid-April, but the idea is to continue to have periodic auctions like that. Uh, and we're also launching an auction uh, to bring energy to off-grid uh, areas in Colombia, so the most remote rural areas. So, so I think that's you know, how we, we've seen uh, and how we've been able to attract investment into this sector. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. That's enormously helpful. So I want to go n next to Kadri Simpson. Uh, Diego Mesa has just outlined all the things that are going on in, in Colombia to accelerate the clean energy transition. The European Union has been in the lead reliably on this. You're now in the lead with the European Green Deal. And so I'm just curious, from your experience, wh which regulatory and policy frameworks do you see as now most important for, for really driving the clean energy transition. Thank you, David, and good afternoon from Brussels. Well, indeed, we do understand that uh, the scale of the change needed to achieve uh, climate neutrality by 2050 is massive. And uh, even in short term, um, in the next decade, to achieve the reduction of uh, greenhouse gases at least by 55 percent needs, uh, needs a lot from our side. And uh, we do believe that there are three necessary things. At first, political willingness, um, um, well, ambition that we do have. We have also political support by our voters. Uh, then we need technological solutions, and we are investing heavily into research and innovation. And of course, uh, we need additional financing. And, uh, and um, in this regard, um, we do know also that um, it means uh, massively improving our energy efficiency and it means phasing out coal and other fossil fuels. And um, last year, um, um, even because of the COVID crisis, um, we didn't change our priorities. And, uh, and despite the challenges, um, it, is, uh, it is a matter of fact that, uh, that we quickly realized that COVID is presenting us uh, with a once-in-a-lifetime challenge. And, uh, and um, we put uh, the clean transition at the heart of our uh, plans for recovery. Um, last July, European leaders agreed on an unprecedented um, financial package. So we will have our long-term budget, but on top of that, there is a recovery um, program 750 billion euros and we have agreed that uh, each national recovery plan um, um, has to include at least 37 percent of our uh, um, expenditure um, dedicated to climate related expenditure um, at the same time this is not enough. Uh, public uh, financing is not enough. We have to convince also our banks and insurers and pension funds and investment funds that um, they need to, um, to invest too. And, uh, and that's why uh, we decided that um, we will make a, it easier for them um, to do um, sustainable investments and um, the European Union taxonomy creates uh, the world's first ever classification system for uh, environmentally sustainable economic activities. And this will give a real boost to sustainable investments. And um, it will actually provide the basis, of, uh, a basis for EU green bonds, eco, eco labels. And, and of course, we need also regulatory framework that supports our climate ambition. And this year, this June, the Commission will adopt a comp comprehensive feature that includes um, emissions trading and effort sharing and energy taxation and also the carbon border mechanism so that we can uh, convince our trading partners to, to follow our lead. And in my area of responsibility, we will revise uh, the renewable energy and energy efficiency directives 
including uh, their targets, so that all our member states uh, will um, will um, um, invest into uh, efficiency, cheapest energy is the one that we don't use, and into renewables. We do expect that after 10 years, after one decade, um, the share of the renew renewables um, in our energy mix must be at least 40%. So these are the steps that we are um, taking. And, and of course, uh, we will not make a change only alone. So um, the role of the energy dialogues and international cooperation is extremely important for us. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you very much for that. So I want to go next to Fatih Barol. Um, Fatih, the, we've just heard about a lot of things going on in Colombia, in the EU. Um, you sit at the International Energy Agency. You have a view of what's happening globally. And I'm just curious, from your vantage point, what do you see in the emerging and developing economies as the biggest opportunities and, and, and the biggest risks? David, we had a small technical issue with Fatih's uh, line, so he's uh, reconnecting, and you okay. can move on and come back to him. Okay. Well, let's go. Let's go next to to, to Joe Taylor. So, um, uh, Joe Taylor, your organization moves capital around, deploys capital, um, and you've just heard about massive policy changes that are underway in Europe. Massive policy changes that have been underway in Colombia, enormously uh, successful. And so, I'm curious. So you're a pension fund. Uh, based in Canada, but you deploy capital uh, globally. And, and um, what kinds of financial solutions do you see as most important um, for, for improving cross-border capital flows in the direction of the energy transition? Well, good morning, David, and um, good afternoon uh, to an evening to other uh, people joining the, uh, this, this, this panel. Um, Maybe I should just introduce who, who we are. So we basically look after about 330,000 teachers and educators in the province of Ontario. We have assets of around 200 billion Canadian, about 160 billion US. So we're a largest institution. We're certainly not the largest, but we're very active globally, as you said, David. And um, you know, we do invest in Europe. We do invest in Colombia and other sort of some of the features that you've heard. So. I guess if I take a slant of, you know, as as is in the in the sort of doing section of trying to influence change in and around clean energy and climate improvement, we sort of look at it through two lenses, I think it's probably easiest to say. So the first one is, you know, we have a large portfolio as it is, um, and therefore as active investors and owners, we do push every company to transition in the longer term to clean energy. Um and why is, why is this important? Because actually through that engagement rather than divestment, I think we can particularly push these companies to do a better job and actually provide um, uh, some additional help and services <clears throat> in and around the world where they may not be av immediately available. Um, but, you know, I think one of the challenging questions we face is particularly around uh, fossil fuel companies. You know, we see that as a transition in terms of being able to have adequate fuel available to, to, to the present, to where we want to go in the future for some of these cleaner energy, sustainable fuel sources. Um, and I think we are committed to being engaged, but what, what does that mean? Um, let me give you a first example. So, you know, we made a commitment recently to having a zero carbon footprint across all of our activities by 2050. So what does that involve? Well, you know, we actually got to talk to every company we invest in and say, how are you measuring your carbon footprint? And what are you actually doing in terms of concrete steps to actually improving what you do to put you in a better position? Um, so a good example of this would be, you know, we're investors in five airports around Europe. Um, you know, we work very hard with those airports to actually move them very much towards a carbon neutral footprint, moving to carbon zero. Obviously, there's been a bit of a hiatus in their activities through the COVID-19 pandemic, which has seen a big uh, change in traffic going through them. Um, the other challenge we have is, you know, we don't often invest on our own. So what, what, we, what we need to do is also persuade other investors to come to a like-minded position to ourselves. And, and where that gets interesting, actually, is, you know, some of the investors we work with have a much more short-term view of what they're trying to achieve and probably 
are less um, thoughtful or less, less sort of able to sort of influence those businesses to make a make a transition. Um, I, I guess the other thing I would say is, you know, we're a very long term investor. Um, I would say by most standards, you know, we often hold assets for ten to twenty years. And one of the issues we face there is actually in most of the areas we'll talk about today, there's a very strong um, government regulatory angle that we have to understand. And that makes it really important for us to be able to have a dialogue with governments and regulatory bodies to really understand what are their needs and what can our companies that we're investing in provide as innovative solutions. And we're very lucky, actually, because of our scale, we can actually engage with governments to try and have that interactive dialogue. And we can also build platform companies, which are really quite material to be able to do something similar. So, again, I think examples always help. If I gave you one, um, we do have an energy platform that develops wind and solar electricity generation. It's called Gubico. Um, it's active in Colombia, but it's also active in many parts of Latin America and Europe. It's got about 80 assets broadly in different stages of development worldwide. Um, and, and to me, that's a great example of a company that's really engaged in trying to talk to governments, understand what the needs are, and actually adapt what they provide to provide solutions. So an illustration recently is they were working with the Ministry of Energy in Vietnam to sort of try and understand what uh, solutions that company, that, that country needs to meet its growing electricity demands. So for us, we work very hard with our companies. We work with the co-investors that work with those companies. And then we work with governments to actually try and provide in innovative solutions to help them with um, developing their needs to uh, cleaner energy. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for that. I want to bring in Fatih Barol now. Um, <clears throat> Fatih, you're at the International Energy Agency of a view of the whole planet, um, not yet other planets. But uh, I'm curious, uh, in, the, in the focus of today's session, which is really about the emerging and developing economies and the clean energy transition there, what, what do you see as the, as the biggest opportunities and the biggest risks um, uh, as these different economies grapple with the enormous investment implications of the clean energy transition? Thank you very much. And greetings to all the colleagues from the International Energy Agency. Uh, it, David, if I may, I want to start with a, a bold, maybe a bit uh, provoking uh, a statement. If our aim is to reach net zero or uh, emissions, if our aim is to address the climate change globally, which I believe is our aim, the, there is no way, there is no way without hugely accelerating the clean energy investment in emerging countries, we can reach this goal. No way whatsoever. Numbers are there. Whatever we do in uh, Europe is very important. We heard uh, from uh, Madam Commissioner excellent uh, steps. Japan or uh, soon United States and elsewhere. Very simple. Very simple. Numbers speak for themselves. We speak with numbers. Today, more than two thirds of the emissions, global emissions, come from the uh, emerging uh, countries. Moreover, more important, in the next 30 years, almost all the growth in global emissions come from these countries. Okay? And we all know, um, there are many scientists here, they know much better than me, one ton of emissions coming from Jakarta or from California or uh, uh, from Paris or from Delhi, it has the same effect on everybody. Emissions don't have a passport. So if you want to be successful altogether, if you want to be successful in California, if you want to avoid the impact of climate change in California, it is extremely important what happens in Delhi, what happens in Jakarta, which decisions are being made. Very simple. And not only the future emissions, but in many countries, especially Asian emerging countries, there is already emissions locked in in the energy infrastructure, which is run by coal and other 
fossil fuels, which are, which are very young in nature, still the investment is not paid back. So therefore, I would very much like to all of us to understand that it is important to move in the United States, of course in Europe, in Japan and elsewhere, but in the absence of hugely accelerating the clean energy transitions and therefore investments, clean investment in those countries, we have no chance whatsoever to reach any of the targets, global targets we are all talking about on a daily basis. This is number one. Number two, investments. We are seeing, we heard uh, from uh, Minister uh, Mesa, the Colombia example, uh, uh, one of the uh, bright spots there. In India, we have solar, very good. In Brazil, we have wind, uh, very good. But when you look at the clean energy investments in emerging countries, we need to multiply it almost by a factor of three. And when I look at the numbers, I don't see currently a big increase or a big uh, jump in the appetite of the investors who we'll talk about the ESGs and so on to invest in those uh, uh, countries. This is the second point. Third point, when we look at globally, capital is available. There is no uh, lack of capital. And therefore, how, and there are huge opportunities on the clean energy, not only power generation only, but in the clean energy uh, area in emerging countries, opportunities, and maybe some of them lucrative opportunities for investments, but they are not going there. So therefore, uh, 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 David, uh, what we thought, and for me, it is the whole nerve center of the climate debate today, if I have to a bit summarize and make it uh, sharper. So what we have taught, how can we de-block the flow of clean investments in the emerging world? For power sector, but also for industry sector, for transportation uh, sector and uh, others, for the new investments, first of all, and also what do we do with the existing young but fossil fuel driven investment, iron, steel, cement, aluminium, power plants. The 10 gigaton of uh, emissions come from the power plants in Asia today, one third alone. So what we have decided, together with our colleagues from the World Economic Forum, uh, Roberto uh, is here, Roberto Bocco is here, the World Bank, we are, for the annual meeting of uh, World Economic Forum in end of May, we are coming with a report with concrete policy recommendations, how we can de-block this uh, for uh, flowing investments in emerging countries. We have three areas that we are going to focus. First, those countries, domestic frameworks, how they should revise, change, and how they can gain investor confidence and how that they are not going to do it only to save the planet, but for their own economic interests of today and economic interests of tomorrow. This is the one. Second, uh, here, international cooperation, the role of international community. Whether or not we need new financial mechanisms, including the donors around the uh, world, we need to create new international mechanisms in order to facilitate or accelerate the flow of clean energy investments in the emerging countries. And third, we are going to discuss and make some concrete policy recommendations to investors around the world, including institutional investors. Many of them are very loud in the tweets, statements, press releases, what role for them in order to accelerate the clean energy investment in those countries. We are, uh, we are fortunate that I see at least 
two of our we here working with, of course, many bright brains around the world. I see uh, Ken Rogoff uh, here, who is going to be part of our advisory board, as well as you, Mr. Chairman, uh, 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 David uh, Victor. And we are not only going to make these recommendations, but we are, each year, we are going to monitor, track the developments of the clean energy investors, who says what, vis-a-vis -vis what they are doing and announce the uh, uh, tracking efforts uh, around the world. So I would like to thank uh, once again the World Economic Forum, as well as our colleagues from the World Bank joining us, putting the force together to address this, in my view, the burning issue of the whole entire global climate debate. Thank you. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for that, Fatih, and very much look forward to this report. I want to ask, I know we're going to lose you in a moment, Fatih, and, and before we lose Diego Mesa, because um, of all the changes in the schedule, I, I want to put the question to you. Fatih's laid out a vision for global investment. We have to think about this as a global problem, massive capital needs, massive potential. Um, uh, Joe's talk, talked about where the capital is. Katri Simpson's talked about this enormous European framework. And, and yet we have to think about this as a global problem. And so I'm curious from your perspective, what do you need to see from the international institutions with regard to trade and investment policies and so on? Because, you know, there's also going to be a lot of tensions uh, here. We're in a new world politically. Uh, we've seen the U.S. Uh, uh, removing support, maybe they're coming back. Katri Simpson talked about border measures. Those are going to be very, very controversial with many countries. And so are you worried about the, whether the international institutions are fit for purpose here? I, I do think, uh, David, that we need to see uh, a change that we're seeing. I mean, I uh, applaud, for example, the recent focus that the IMF has been putting on climate issues and uh, building, you know, uh, a greener economy, if you wish. And I think uh, COVID-19 has helped accelerate this. Obviously, the International Energy Agency has been leading uh, the pack and has been, you know, be able to join forces with uh, the World Bank and the IMF in different reports. Uh, but I, I think that's that's critical. And, and the reason is, for example, taking the example of, of Colombia. Uh, Colombia is a country that only uh, produces about 0.4% of total global emissions. Uh, so we're not a big contributor. However, uh, we're one of the countries that is most affected by climate change. We're exposed to a linear phenomenon. So we, we do see that obviously we have a responsibility to act and that's why we're doing it. But this has to be a collective effort uh, at a global level. And if we don't have all the financial international institutions and political international institutions uh, driving this force, uh, that would be impossible to achieve as you know, as one planet, as one world. So, so I, I do think that we need to continue to um, strengthen uh, the efforts that we've seen from uh, the IEA, uh, from the World Bank, from the uh, European Union, because this has to be at the forefront of the global agenda, uh, not only from a climate change point of view, but also from an economic point of view. Oh, thank you very much for that. So I just have a couple minutes left. I want to put the same question to you, Kadri Simpson. Um, big visions in Europe, they hinge on international institutions. Uh, the U.S. is back. I'm not quite sure what to believe of what the U.S. is saying. So what, what do you need to see from international institutions? And, and are you um, confident they're going to be able to deliver? Well, we see that um, well, multilateralism gives us a, a stage where we can find like-minded uh, governments. And, uh, and as you know, well, we presented our Green Deal before the COVID crisis, before the recession. And despite the fact that it happened uh, already a year and two months ago, we presented it as our growth strategy. Because, well, um, um, changing our energy mix also uh, brings uh, waste opportunities for our businesses, but also our neighborhood, our trading partners. And by doing so, we will uh, hit um, uh, several goals. So we are doing something good for our environment and um, for our globe, but we are also helping our, our um, businesses and um, renewable energy transition also uh, creates more jobs than, uh, than uh, the traditional um, uh, sector. So um, I do hope that uh, leading by example, um, helps also other governments to, to make their mind and to commit to climate neutrality, like several, um, several governments have done already. 
Excellent. Well, thank you very much for that. So we've had, um, we're just approaching the end of, of the open session. We've had a, a scribe um, uh, drawing a picture of everything we've said. So I'm very interested to see what uh, we're going to learn from, from the scribe as to all the different topics that we engage with. We can put that up on the screen. I think it's up on the screen right now. And, and I guess I just want to emphasize as we close um, the, the crucial importance of the policy and regulatory frameworks and, and institutional arrangements needed to unlock what are you know, vast quantities of capital out there, but capital that's trying to figure out what, what really to believe and where to deploy around the clean energy transition.